morning. Welcome to the Kitty Hawk Investor Series. It's great to have you all joining us today. I wanted to start today with just a quick update on Kitty Hawk Ventures 3. I'm very excited to announce that uh, we have actually done our first close of our new fund. We've circled up about $24 million in commitments and uh, did the first close on January 15th and have started making our uh, very first investments. Uh, first one into a company called Vitalize Health and the second one into a space company called Explore. So uh, great to uh, to be up and running. I want to thank everyone for their support. We've got a bunch of our new LPs joining us today, so, so welcome. Uh, secondly, I want to let you know, you may notice a slightly uh, different energy level today. Unfortunately, on uh, Saturday, I was diagnosed with COVID, uh, I'm doing fine, but uh, I've got a little bit of a uh, chest uh, cold going on and you may hear me coughing a little bit. And, and again, kind of the energy level might not be uh, quite as high as normal. So thanks for, for bearing with me. Feel you know super lucky and grateful to be uh, have great care and at home and safe and, and all that. So uh, all good and uh, did not want to cancel today as I was just so excited to be able to one, bring the community together and two, to be able to connect with my uh, friend and someone I admire uh, very much, Mary Lou Jepson. So as you know, these calls are our monthly kind of gathering of our community of CEOs, of LPs, of advisors in our fund. Uh, and we bring everyone together to, to connect with a, uh, with a thought leader in an area that we're excited about, maybe an area that we've invested in, but a great opportunity for us to, to learn and connect. And we really have a, a truly uh, amazing guest today. So Mary Lou Jepson has been involved with leading organizations such as Google X, uh, Facebook's Oculus. She served as faculty at the MIT Media Lab. She is a renowned speaker. I've gotten to see her on the TED main stage. She's joined us at Singularity University in Abundance 360 and is always just uh, an extraordinarily insightful speaker. Uh, among the many awards she has received, she was named one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time Magazine. She's launched four startups, including one laptop per child with Nicholas Negroponte. Uh, she served there as the CTO and chief architect and delivered into mass production a $100 laptop that you probably heard about and that grew into an absolutely uh, enormous business that she's going to tell, uh, tell us about, I hope. Uh, Mary Lou studied studio and art and electrical engineering uh, at Brown University. She received her Master of Science in Holography from the MIT Media Lab uh, and then returned to Brown to receive a PhD in optical sciences. So today, Mary Lou Jebson serves as the founder and CEO of Open Water, which was actually the very first investment we made out of Kitty Hawk Ventures 2 and uh, was just thrilling for me to be able to, to back her and her uh, efforts to change the world, which you'll hear about, and to get to join some, some really extraordinary uh, investors who are supporting her. So with Open Water, Mary Lou is pushing the edges of what's possible in optics and physics to create new types of devices that see into the human body and interact with the human body. Uh, their technology is not only gonna enable faster, cheaper, and smaller alternatives to MR, uh, the MRI, but it's also gonna have significant implications for uh, brain-computer interfaces and, and perhaps even telepathy, which we'll get into as well. So Mary Lou also has an extraordinary personal story, which, uh, which she'll share with us, or I hope she'll share with us. Uh, and with that, I'd like to ask you to, to join me in welcoming Mary Lou Jebson. Thank you so much. That's pretty comprehensive. Thank yeah, you. <laughs> Generous introduction. Well, it's uh, you have an amazing background, and it's been uh, you know as I mentioned, just thrilling to uh, to get to know you over the last kind of six or seven years, and to be part of Open Water. Uh, and I really appreciate you make yourself available and joining us today. Thanks for having. Thanks for betting on us. I didn't realize we were the first investment from Fund Two. That's yeah, amazing. The very first. Thank you. Happened in exponential medicine, I think, where we uh, where we made that come together. So, Mary Lou, uh, I thought maybe we could kind of start off and just have you take us through your uh, you know quick uh, summary of your extraordinary career and kind of what's uh, you know what you know, the different facets of it and what's kind of led you to uh, to open water today. It's interesting. It was such a great introduction. What happened is I fell in love with holography when I was eighteen. My parents um, wanted me to be able to get a good job, so. Um, so they said they'd help me pay for college if I majored in electrical engineering. I think today parents might say that with computer science. And so I was stuck with that. I got into Brown and MIT, but I chose Brown because it had um, 
liberal arts and uh, to maintain my sanity in electrical engineering, I took a lot of art courses. And this is fundamental. The reason I mention it to who I am because of the great introduction, I don't have to say, you know, whatever. I was, I've been a CTO at companies for about 13 years, a CEO for about 10 years, an executive at Google and Facebook for Intel for another six years and professor for another few years as well. But um, the fundamental thing I fell in love with when I was 18 is holography. And I, it's the closest thing to a religious experience I ever had. And that's what sort of powered me through all this incredible learning on the edges of things that were um, basically a very unpopular, unfunded area that I became quite expert in. Also, that got me into virtual reality and augmented reality pretty early. And I co-founded the first company to, to, to make something called, we called micro displays and the name of the company was micro display. And so I um, have done all these things with hardware, software and um, display optics, human visual system for, for my whole career um, and really pioneered a lot of different products. Um, so I made the world's first holographic video system. And a lot of this is feeding why I started Open Water, the, the new company or it's a five-year-old company that I have that, that you invested in that we'll talk about today. Um, but in, uh, you know, what can I say? You've already covered so much of my career. I feel like there's there's well, not. Tell us maybe a little bit about what is it about holography and, and maybe help people understand what what is what is holography and, and what uh, what really resonated with you? Oh, um, it's just, it's a, it's, <laughs> I hate to say it, but what I fell in love with is the analog nature of it. Um, you know, like the whole room is a camera. You had these, this is in the early eighties, lasers and floating tables and you couldn't move and pieces of film. And, but I, I worked on pioneering the electronic form of that so that we could record light, not just its intensity, but its phase because light is a wave. You can think of it as a wave, it's a particle wave duality, but but you know it, it is a wave. And so if you can record the phase and intensity of something, there's a lot more information there. And so much of it is, it's all neglected. Um, and, and by phase, I mean, like if you drop rocks in a pond, you see the ripples and the ripples interfere. And by taking a picture of the ripples, you can decode where the rocks um, dropped, but so much more by recording the phase. And so this is um, uh, really also why I, I, I love the idea of, I know there's a lot of virtual reality, augmented reality fans out there. You know, a lot of people don't wanna wear masks. They don't wanna wear anything on their face. It should appear in thin air. Like it really, we need to make better displays that are the, uh, really, I got into, I had a, I had a, brain tumor um, 25 years ago. Um, and after that, um, I really needed health insurance because I'm American. So I decided to do something practical and learn how to ship um, consumer electronics distinguished by their screens. And now we're at the point where we call them screens. They're the most expensive component in any device. They're the most power hungry. And it's what we call the device. And when I got into this, they didn't even think the screens were part of the hardware. So it helped that I had that double E degree. I understand how CPUs work, but CPUs aren't leading on devices now. Really, the interaction with the human visual system and audio and, and our, our senses are what's leading. And um, so I really did a lot of work in that area in new kinds of display technologies in the 90s, 2000s, and so forth with um, projection systems, VR systems, glasses, wristwatch video is what we called it before, Apple Watch, and a lot of really pioneering stuff there, figuring out the technology. Then I moved to Asia for about a decade. I gave up my faculty position at MIT when I co-created this not-for-profit with a couple billion dollars of revenue that catalyzed $30 billion of revenue for a for-profit laptop. laptop per child yeah. and became the fastest growing consumer electronic category ever recorded and most importantly transformed the lives of 100 million children in the developing world yeah. and the sort of ancestor of that now is the chromebook because that was 15 years ago in the life cycle of consumer electronics but i went back to mit saying hey some of our students aren't going to become professors they're going to become engineers how do we teach them how to work with a trillion dollar supply chain in asia because if they have to make a startup and build their own factory, 
God help them. I mean, it, it's a billion dollars in five years, mm -hmm. unless you can figure out how to design and invent for manufacturing processes and materials that are allowed in these multi-billion dollar factories, where if you can get access to them, you do need to move product. They're not R&D lines by any stretch, but you can make your first sample in a few months. At MIT with a postdoc, maybe I can make the first sample in a year. The problem comes in the second sample. Three months later, I can make a million of them in the $12 billion factory of, let's say, Sharp in Sakai. Um, the postdoc takes another year to make a second sample because they're, you know, like the, the laboratories are great, but they're not the quality, the process window, the everything yeah. is not set. And I just got hooked on instead of, you know, what do you want to do? I want to make things that impact people's lives. And to do that, I just thought there were not enough MIT professors sleeping on the factory floors of the world. And, you know, in Asia, like, oh, you got your PhD, you should be the, like, I grew up on a farm in rural Connecticut, I'm fine to sleep on the factory floors. And so you just learn so much, because um, so much of it is unpublished and trade secret that you, you, you are, are able to leverage this supply chain in ways that are, are non-incremental. You can skip generations by really thinking of the architecture of the subcomponents in the system together. So designing new chips that can go into this thing. So you design it both at the same time. It's crazy. It's totally crazy. Like at Open Water, we've designed three new components and a whole new system and architecture and the AI, all of it, you know, and it's it's nuts, but it's it's a way that you can innovate. You can jump 20 years in a couple of years by, so by going for it. Before we get too deeply into open water, I would love to touch a little bit on your kind of unique health journey. You mentioned having a brain tumor. I mean, as I think about your background uh, and all the things that have created you to bring you to this point today and to have you in this uh, at, at this crossroads of being able to create what I think is going to be uh, an absolutely enormous company that's going to have such big, uh, such a big impact. The, your health scare and, and some of those, uh, what you went through with your brain tumor feels to me like an important part of that, of that story that's gotten you to this point. Sure. And the brain tumor in, re in retrospect, we understand started when I was about 13 and I spent mm -hmm. many months in the hospital and not to date myself, but that was 1978 and <laughs> MRI was not available then. Um, and it was an unknown blood disease and no one could figure out what it was. And then I relapsed periodically over the next 17 years um, to the point where it, it got really bad when I was 29 and doing my, my PhD in, in optics at Brown. And they let me see like the professors, Brown had a med school, but nobody could diagnose what I had. I was, I was sleeping 20 hours a day. I was, I was in a wheelchair, um, didn't move half my face, bodies were full of sores. And really where I, I threw in the towel was when I could no longer subtract and I didn't think I deserved a PhD in physics. So I dropped out and went, um, wow. called my parents and um, asked if I could go get a room in their house and, um, you know, die there. And then um, a professor sprung for the cost of an MRI. So you have really bad headaches, right? I'm like, yeah, really bad headaches, really bad headaches. So they found the brain tumor. So I was excited. I was thrilled. My fr friends, family were mortified. And like, diagnosis, that's the key. So right. it took finally knew. Yeah, of course. After getting the diagnosis, it took a month, one month to go have the brain surgery, get better, and petition to get back into grad school. Mm -hmm. I'll admit it, I'm not proud. I use the, I had a brain tumor <laughs> excuse. That's <laughs> and, I got the excuse. <laughs> and in six months, I finished my PhD and with two students got, two other students got $4 million from DARPA to start a first company, the micro display one that I mentioned. Um, but every day for 25 years, I have to take a dozen medications or I die because I'm missing. It's so awful. I, I was the only girl <laughs> at the time in physics and it hit my pituitary gland. And that's the one that makes all your hormones. And the thing is, like, adrenaline is a hormone. Cortisol is a hormone. Thyroid, human growth hormone. And yes, mm. estrogen, testosterone. So I experimented with what I wanted me to be because I had thought up to that time, I hadn't done much thinking about the brain. I just thought it was all about the, the gray matter and the logic. And, and mm -hmm. I had to face like 
I would change my doses. I'd be, feel like a completely different person. And I thought I had no idea. And so actually for a while, I tried dosages of a, a guy in his mid twenties. Cause I thought, well, what's it like to be a guy? Like I couldn't handle it. I could not handle it. I don't know how you guys do, but I think I actually got it wrong. And it was more like a teenage boy because I'd never been exposed to those chemicals. But yeah, um, it's funny. I was like angry all the time. I thought about sex constantly and I was probably right. the smartest person in the entire world. That's amazing. I'm like, whoa, I got along with guys a lot better after that though. Guys changed my dose. So I've sort of created a me I like, and I think it's a huge advantage. I also don't get jet lag because cortisol peaks in your body an hour before you wake up, but I don't make it. So I wake up, I take cortisol. I'm good. So there's some advantage on um, no jet lag and different things. And also um, unwittingly, just as a means of survival, I had to learn neuroendocrinology because um, at that time it was illegal to replace all of the chemicals your pituitary gland would make if you had one. And so I um, spent a lot of time and effort to be able to experiment with what um, would work for me and um, found some really innovative doctors who would work with me and write scripts and do measurements. So it took, it took a bunch of time to, to do it, but you know, I, I think it's my secret advantage. <laughs> some level. I think I mean, it is. But yeah. I, I mean, it's just an extraordinary story and that you've been able to kind of, you know, uh, get so deep and, and to understand how your body works and really to become the, the kind of CEO of your own healthcare um, and, uh, and navigate yourself to such a robust place. I mean, it's, it's really amazing, Mary Lou. So, so let's talk, let's talk about open water. Uh, you know, maybe you can kind of frame up the, the business and, and kind of what you're, what you're trying to create, what you're trying to solve. I know you're really pushing the edges in, in uh, physics and, and optics and have invented some uh, amazing technologies. And uh, anyway, love to hear more about kind of where things stand. Five years ago, I was sitting as the executive director of engineering at Facebook Oculus for doing, um, you know, Mark's vision, Mark Zuckerberg's vision of bringing a billion people online in, in, in high fidelity, virtual reality, augmented reality as soon as possible. And um, really did a lot of um, great work there that I can't wait for them to ship. That is another whole subject to talk about. But I noticed that through my now power at <laughs> this big company with big checks and my colleagues at Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and so forth, that we were making components, if we get back to the 18 year old me making holographic video systems, we were making components with pixel sizes with the size of the wavelength light of the light and camera chips had pixel sizes, the size of the wavelength of light. That means you can record the waves and the wavelength of light, the phase, which opens up holography. So combine that with this desire to figure out, I, I've been pretty passionate about trying to figure out how to do brain computer interfaces non-invasively and medical imaging for lower cost. And I was quite aware as you all should be aware, um, the invention of fire was a really big deal. We'd sit around the fire and the fire warms our bones. That's infrared light. It goes through our bodies. It scatters. But I realized that with these pixel sizes of the wavelength of light, there might be a way to see inside of our bodies and brains, read and write them using um, light and displays and um, camera chips, things that I had, have pioneered for my whole career and shipped at billion dollar level. And I understand like all of the parts, the, the physics, the, the manufacturing, the, the business to the shipping and all of that. And I thought, wow, we have every brain cell and consumer electronics working either on LIDAR or um, next generation VR, AR. Nobody's going to do this. And so I decided to um, quit my super cushy, extremely well-paid job at Facebook because um, I've been lucky. I don't actually need any more money. I, if I had a more um, frivolous, or, I don't know, I don't spend that. I don't know. I did, just didn't need the money. I wanted to do something um, that I, I, I thought maybe I could have a unique contribution because I saw this and I know, know a lot about these areas. So I embarked on it basically and sometimes you get lucky. Um, about a year and a half ago, Apple put um, a camera chip in their phone that has high quantum efficiency in the near infrared. That's the part of the fire that warms your body that goes through with um, 
pixel size is the size of the wavelength of light. So now we're living in a world where these chips cost a dollar because a million of them ship a day. The cost of something is related to one variable in consumer electronics, one, how many you ship. So that's great. The laser was nearly impossible <laughs> to design, but we designed it and now we, we sit here in clinical trials um, um, with a laser and a camera chip seeing blood flow at a hundred times better than anything reported in the literature. Like I've seen like some of the BCI companies report something like 200 times lower fidelity than what we're doing. <laughs> and um, meanwhile, painfully, um, we decided not to do brain computer interface for our first product because there's a huge urgent unmet need in the number two killer, the number two killer in the world isn't, number one killer isn't COVID. It's heart. The number two killer is stroke. Mm. Um, COVID doesn't make the top five. And these are day in, day out. 85 million people have a stroke every year. About eight, a million of them die immediately. And 40% of them are permanently disabled. They don't go back to work. They've lost too much of their brain. And it's an urgent thing because there's a drug you can take 86% of the time that can bust the clot. 86% of the time, it's a clot. 14% of the time, it's a bleed. Um, if you know where that happens, there's large vessel occlusion, which is 10% of the time, which needs a mechanical surgery. But if you can direct the patient to the right hospital, they, don't, they can walk and talk and go back to work again. But if you don't, they don't. And there's no way to- time, How uh, soon after a stroke do you have to um, receive the medicine? Four hours is the limit, but if you could do it in one hour, it would be better. better. And yeah. so like- So rapid discovery. It's obvious when somebody's got a gunshot wound or a stabbing, you gotta get in the hospital. Unfortunately, half of the time, half of the time, stroke is misdiagnosed on first interaction with an EMT or urgent care because there's no way to measure the blood flow. Hmm. So we figured out a way to measure blood flow with a, camera chips and this laser that we've um, designed, really, really high coherence laser for the people on the line that know about lasers. It's got a 300, it's got a sub megahertz coherence, or if we change that to time, 300 meter coherence in a pulsed diode laser in the infrared. It was nearly impossible and existential for the company to create that laser, but now we have it. Um, it's right now a couple thousand dollars. It can go, and we're working on wafer-based ones right now that we've got samples of that could be twenty to fifty dollars in mass production. How expensive was it when you created your first first version of this, just to give people a sense as to five hundred thousand dollars on a four by eight table by one foot with unbelievable power <laughs> that we had to put into the room, water cooling the whole bit. And oh, and that's it was three, four years ago. Yeah, it was so buggy. And so yeah. I, you know, two years, we have a Nobel laureate in laser physics on the team. We have like, we have an incredible laser team. But really, since we got lucky on the, the, the phone side, we've developed that. And the, there's another component we use for the structural. We use sub megahertz um, focused sound beams to um, change the wavelength of the light. So then we can interfere just the part that's changed color. It's like Doppler shift, but you can do it with light too. So there's a bunch of cool physics in this. Um, and so we're really just looking at what we can make in high volume mass production, ultimately cheaply. But then you're thinking, well, how are you going to make money? So the interesting thing is our advantage so like, sorry, Vinod Kosla is one of our investors. And he always says, he has this thing like, okay, we know what Mount Everest is, low cost medical imaging for all, right? Great, everybody can get scanned all the time in your smartphone or a device, got it. Um, you are doing this business thing, so how are you gonna make money? So we came up this year, everybody else sort of shut down. We're an essential business. So we haven't had a break, we just, I met at the beginning of the year with somebody, I gave a TED talk on this a couple of years back with somebody that had been unrelenting. He, he runs um, a comprehensive stroke center and he said, stroke, stroke. And I said, well, I don't know if we can see stroke. We're focused on mechanical. We tried it during, during COVID. 
and it turned out we could see um, just blood flow with this extraordinarily high fidelity. And there's this huge unmet need. And even uh, like just two months ago, um, Medicare, Medicaid um, approved a $1,000 reimbursement for detecting stroke um, early. Hmm. And so we can, well, it costs a hundred dollars, like the hardware, we can get a thousand dollars reimbursement for each test because the, the hospitals, everybody wants to help these patients. And it's this urgent, urgent unmet need more urgent um, in some sense. I mean, the, the numbers are worse than COVID. It's awful. Yeah. Um, so now, the, device, the product, uh, can you talk a little bit about the actual, the form factor? And is it something like ultimately could it be pushed out and be in a, in an ambulance and, and that detection happening there? Or would it be a device that, you know, potentially you might even own? As a you know, right now it's in a cart and we're using a wand and we're using a wand because uh, we wanted flexibility and where to hit the head. Ultimately probably a headband of mm. different sensors, but we wanted to perfect the module that's in, in the wand. And there's a cart, the cart goes away. <laughs> the cart was just, I used to work for Sergey because Sergey Aqua hired my company, Sergey mm. at, at Google. And he used to say this thing, the best products are the ones that go through the most iterations. So as we went through IRB on our first clinical trial, which is underway at a hospital with humans, um, I, I quoted Sergey. And I said, you know, we probably don't want to do a 510K with the FDA for this because we want to be totally safe, not hurt anybody, but be able to, as we see how the, the technicians use it, what the information that we want to be able to make changes so that we can make the best product once we put it on the manufacturing line, you know, you're not allowed to make changes <laughs> a little bit later. So we want to make as many changes as we can make now. So we made it a big on a cart so we can make the changes. We're shrinking that. And we also wanted to enable that wand to be used. Like, can, you, can we detect cardiac output? If we can, well, to make a patch for that, we can predict heart attack. Can it be used on, we're talking to some, some people working on um, SDGs, maternal health, developing world. There's a lot of issues with the placenta and the fetus where we think we can measure that or angiogenesis, which is cancer. Basically, um, the cancer um, makes um, the vessels, the blood vessels grow to, to surround the cancer so that it can steal all the blood from your body so the cancer can grow faster and kill you. And so there's all kinds of things about understanding blood flow and oxygenation in the cancer that are really helpful for the treat, treatment of cancer that just simply don't exist right now. So there's all kinds of things that we can do with just the blood flow, with just this cool laser and the camera chips. And there's no reason that, in, as we put it, it's not the cost right now that matters, it's the fidelity. But then, you know, we're on this path of, there's no reason as we perfect that module, we can, can't make a multi-module system that's, you know, I talked with our dear friend, Peter Diamandis is like, can I have a bed with this in it and, or a pillow or, you know. Right. All of that's possible. Be scanning you all the time. Yeah. All of that's possible in in the future. We decided to start with this large, urgent, unmet need. Probably everybody listening to this knows somebody who's had a stroke, and yep. it's it's just devastating what happens to to forty percent of them. I mean, ten percent die, but but forty percent have permanent disability from something that if we if we just even if they have the stroke and we could get them the therapy earlier, there'd be there'd be any disability. Yeah, extraordinary. Mary Lou, I'd love to also just talk a little bit about uh, brain computer interface. And and I know that there's a you know tremendous amount of applicability uh, to that world with what you're doing as well. Um, and maybe it's not something you're as immediately focused on, but but love to kind of hear how you're thinking about that, how um, open water could potentially play in that in that uh, that field. Right. So I was really struck by the work of uh, Jack Gallant at UC Berkeley, who um, used to uh, used graduate students in MRIs and were able to decode what images they were thinking of, what words they were about to say by making them lie in MRI machines for 100 hours, getting training data on YouTube videos or podcasts or what have you. Um, other people have done this work in Japan. They, they, made, they let 
students fell asleep, they were woke up, told to capture, you know, what were they dreaming about, and then correlated the data from the fMRI scan. That's the video form of MRI that basically looks at the use of oxygen or not use of oxygen in the brain. The part of the brain working um, is the part using the oxygen. And with that coarse sort of centimeter size um, voxels, looking at maybe 1200 voxels, it's extraordinary um, the work that's been done in creating grainy images of what the student was thinking or words. So I saw that work and I thought, wow, this changes everything, right? Like all we have to do is up the resolution and shrink that. So we've actually done that. So now we're looking at getting to 0.1% blood flow fidelity. We're using it for stroke first because there's a large earn met need, 85 million people a year. But the same system we're developing with a different software layer enables brain computer interface without and I think Elon's amazing, but I've had non-elective brain surgery, <laughs> the hardest thing I did in my life. The yeah. one hole in my skull, um, uh, no, <laughs> I don't see a million people doing that anytime soon. If it's that or death, sure, bring it on, of course. But as a consumer, it doesn't, the, the, people aren't going to yeah. do it. Like it has to be non-invasive. And there's, there's like three huge problems in BCI. One is and brain computer interface. One is the hardware. Like, how are you going to say that? Are you going to do the one inch hole in the neural lace or the, some of the other solutions out there are, are, are interesting. There's this hardware problem. We think we have some pretty compelling, it's a new modality. We had to really walk the hard, you heard about the laser, the, the oh my God, it was so hard, but we're here. Um, the next part is the interpretation of the data, right? And what from blood flow or, we, we actually, I showed live on stage Ted at Ted two and a half years ago, us focusing light through skull and brain, real skull, fake brain, phantom brain, because you can't <laughs> bring real brain into Canada. It got <laughs> stopped at customs, even though it was dead. Um, so we use fake brain. Um, but we can focus to two microns through scattering material using this holography thing, which is the sort of key to understanding me, but so we can even focus and turn on or read neuron states. We know um, one of the people in our team did this for her PhD, um, that before an electron pulse proceeds down the neurons, it's so funny, I'm an electrical engineer, they usually think it's all about the electronics, but before that, the calcium channels and stuff change, and so the membrane of, of the um, neuron roughens, and so that scatters light in a different way. We can measure that. It's a bit like roughening. Like if I took sandpaper to my glasses, that would scatter the light going into my eye. We can see it optically. And so there's even more we can do than just seeing um, the blood flow and the use of oxygen and non-oxygen with our technology suite. But just changing the software layer enables that. So the software layer and the decoding and the AI, the tools store of time, AI machine learning, the third component is what's ethical and legal and how should we should use it. <laughs> so that's also this huge area. And, and I, I, I think what's going to happen is the next 10 years, it's going to be not so great, not so great, not so great. And then it's going to get really good. And people say, oh, what happened? And we've seen a preview of that with the social media phenomenon. And so how do we be smart about figuring out what's the right thing to do here <laughs> what, what do you think bci actually looks like in in the real world in in 10 years like how you know how are people using this technology is it for work is it to communicate with each other is it for you know people with uh physical conditions to control machines and enable them to be able to walk um and interact i think it'll, I think it'll start with that with people yeah. with brain disease or to move phantom limbs but where we get to with it is you know, it, it can leapfrog language, right? It can make us understand each other. And we can have lockboxes, privacy, mystery. We can say, no, you can't we don't get into that area. You know, there's like um, good tokens and, and so forth. But maybe we can, we have so many misunderstandings and so many slights and so many, and then getting in and understanding, um, you know, I had to do it with my hormones on some level, but like getting in and understand, like it was really awful to have this look at, at 
what I could be. Um, but that mirror of what do we want to be? How, how do we evolve? But, but mm. what can we be capable of as humanity? Right. By the way, not just humanity, everything with a brain, right? Like, you know, when's the first non-human going to get into singularity university like you know with diversity seriously i mean so with different perspectives i mean um octopuses are supposed to be really smart they've got neurons all over their body so like that's been sort of beyond 10 years maybe but maybe you know maybe not why can't we collaborate with animals they're good at smelling covid right like if if we had a better signal um, but but really, as we talk about humans, I think, you know, the root of almost every problem comes to communication. And if we could better communicate with each other, I think one of the issues is, um, it's funny, Peter Gabriel, uh, the, the rock star musician, human rights activist named my company Open Water, or he, he wrote an essay about the general field, um, called it Open Water, because um, it's a blue space, white space, whatever, a blue sky. But really it was about, he used water because it was about how do we take swimming lessons to learn how to let our brains swirl around with each other? Mm. Because, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of issues, but what can we do? I, I think visually, I just want to dump my thoughts to the computer, dump my thoughts to the other person. I've spent so much of my career in conference rooms with whiteboards, with people I don't speak the same language with, drawing equations and diagrams to get to understanding. Um, if I could just go like and dump something to somebody's brain, they'd say, right. oh, what about this? I'm like, oh, that's a good point. Like, da, 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 da. And it'd be so much faster and more efficient to do it. I, I think it's inevitable because we could say, no, don't want to understand how the brain works. Totally uninterested. But, you know, the National Academies of most developed countries have said of the top five things you can do as a technologist, understanding how the brain works is important. Um, brain disease is the most expensive healthcare cost for every country in the world. The drugs haven't been new for decades. With this with mental health as well, mental, mental health. health like, yeah. There was a study published two years ago where five hospitals pooled 1,200 functional MRI images. That's the thing that measures the blood flow and the oxygenation, showing that there were patterns of different types of depression. So if you sort of play that further, if you could do an fMRI for low cost, you could actually have an objective measure of brain disease, uh, depression, schizophrenia, whatever. And then you could see earlier how a prescribed therapy was working or not making it better mm. or worse mm. because and probably also diagnosing earlier right to be able I, to start to see absolutely yeah. diagnosing or, or expressing yeah. symptoms yeah and understanding the underlying like uh, there's people that think alzheimer's is really just a small vessel disease hmm. group and who, there's a lot of thought on what alzheimer's is and how to cure it but some of it is clearly um, the flow of getting oxygen to the neurons, like th it's a plumbing problem and there's more to it, of course. But with these tools, we're going to be able to understand more about this. Again, we're starting with stroke, but the whole gambit of that. And then even we, we can write as well um, by focusing these beams. So surgery without the knife, not... Yeah, that's it's being done now. We're trying to be focused ultrasound. Um, we're collaborating with a group of Ann Arbor that like focuses it down for like a picosecond and vaporizes the tissue so it doesn't swell. It's um, it is such a, an exciting time right now for you and for open water and to start actually uh, directly touching uh, patients and, and helping people. So um, with that, Mary Lou, I want to thank you uh, so much for joining us today and for uh, sharing your, your brilliance and your passion for what you're doing and, and your life story. It's just always such a pleasure to, to uh, get to chat with you and learn from you. And uh, again, so excited to have uh, Kitty Hawk as, uh, as an investor and supporter. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for um, picking us and, and your support. Thank you, my friend.